We are finally at it again. Grab your cranial foil and get ready for the 10 hat talks. We are going to be discussing dragons. Finally, finally. I know some of you have really been looking forward to this. So now that I have shown off with the green screen, my silly tin foil hat, I am going to take it off. If you do not like tin foil hats or Bible or you know, whatever else we're going to talk about, then scroll on, move on, and, and go do your own thing, okay? Because this is a place for people who like to talk about crazy fun things and what they have to do with the Bible. And I will let, we've got a full house today. I am going to let my co-hosts all introduce themselves, beginning with Shelly. Hi everyone, I'm Shelly. Um, I'm a homeschool mom of 11. Only six of them are still school age. I consider myself a Christian truther mom because yeah, I have I have a symbolic tinfoil hat. I don't actually have a physical one, but trust me, it's there. And uh, I have a YouTube channel called There's No Place Like Home. And I talk about a lot of this same stuff on my question the narrative playlist on, on that series. Awesome. And we have Catherine, the dragon author. Yes, sorry. I am trying to wash a mud muddy toddler um, as I'm doing this. So I am Catherine Fogelman White, and I am a fantasy author. I have had a very long standing love of dragons. I love researching them. I love reading about them, all of the myths, the legends, and even the books and stories where they are told where they are, seem like they're not myths and legends, where they are very real entities. So, yeah, I like dragons a lot. So I am a certified dragon fan. So, yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay, Debbie? My name is Deborah or Debbie Hanyon, and uh, I am known by some as homeschooling dietitian mom. And I'm so, I feel so privileged to be part of these ladies, um, to be in, you know, in with these ladies and to be able to talk with them and everything. And I also am fascinated by dragons. I don't know as much about them as uh, Catherine for sure, but I do still remember the first time I realized that they were in the Bible. Um, in the book of Job and how amazed, how amazed I was by that. And it's just really strengthened my belief in the Bible and really opened up the Bible to, to be real, you know, a real thing, an exciting thing, not just some old dusty book. So I'm excited to be here. Amen. And Emmy. Um, hello there. I am Emmy Maynard and I am a homeschooling mom of 11 also. Uh, number 12 is on the way and, and um yeah i'm with the mayor mayor and i'm very much in the bible and i am a relatively new tin header if you will um but i'm loving learning it as i read scripture and like seeing all these things come together and i've, I've always loved dragons too i like i always joke i'm like yeah when i'm in heaven or in the new heavens and new earth i'm gonna be riding around on a dragon so i'm excited to talk about dragons and uh learn more about them because I'm still learning a lot about them as well. Awesome. awesome. You reminded me that I, I, I meant to say that I have one boy and he just turned 18 in May and he's thinks he's graduated, but I'm still <laughs> making him study for the GED. Just in case. You never know what will happen in 10 years. So he's been, I mean, and he coaching. has his own YouTube channel. What is it called? I it's forgot. called, um, TriMet West. Yes. 103 fan. So yes. if you like trains, that is an awesome little channel to visit. Give him He's some love. A lot of views on some of his videos. He just puts he some really actual... does. They're they're good videos. He does a good job with what with what he does. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and of course I'm Donita, homeschool mom of six. Uh 
five down, one to go. And uh, yeah, I've been a conspiracy theorist for as long as I can remember. A majority of my conspiracy theories have come true now, as I'm sure most of our watchers will <laughs> attest to the last several years. But one of the most fun things that I can come up with is definitely uh, the dragons and what what people think about dragons so i'm going to share screen here i was going to start out with proverbs 25 2 it is the glory of god to conceal a thing but the honor of kings is to search out a matter and that is part of what we are going to be doing today I uh, I did do some slides, but I also pulled up some extra stuff after I got the slides done. Uh, this is a very interesting photo. A bunch of cowboys out in the wild west in front of the mercantile and stable with, what does that look like? That's a pteranodon. <laughs> yes. Or it could, could definitely be a dragon. Yeah, yeah. I mean... The idea of the dinosaurs and stuff, uh, that's relatively new. The word dinosaur is relatively new. Uh, before that time, anything that was big and crazy looking basically got called a dragon, right? And we have so many things. I, this was just fun. <laughs> it's got Nessie. I was looking up. The Loch Ness Monster. There's the Loch Ness Monster, the Champlain Monster. Oh, there's a bunch of them. There's not just that one, but they all all uh, described very similarly. And this has got uh, the Bigfoot and then they're visiting with the aliens. And I'm like, well, that just kind of, that kind of shows it, doesn't it? It's got every everything in there at the same time and just showing all of the stuff and then I found this I've seen some of these videos and some of you guys might have as well it's like some real dragons on video or in pictures that people have caught and just they've got some very interesting ones in this one I'd seen this one before at one point had you guys seen this one before I yeah, have not I've seen, seen that one. Really? <laughs> and I had even seen, see, it looks like they've kind of, it's like it's using its arms or something. Yeah. And somebody had actually caught one of these and, nice. and had it. And, and this was in Asia, I'm pretty sure. And then let's see. Yeah. Never ceases to amaze me though. Yeah. These the things are just... out there. That makes me think about knowledge increasing in the end times, like what you said amazing yes the stuff yes. that's out there when you look <clears throat> and then this one here and we've seen something similar to this and, and maybe it's photoshopped i i mean it could be but we've actually seen something kind of similar to this not quite as close they were having trouble getting it focused in but some pretty interesting wings going on definitely not a bird and then it's flying off. And yeah, Paul had actually got something like that on camera at one point. Um, something very similar to something like this. Um, that one very well could be Photoshopped. I don't know. But uh, it was yeah. very interesting. You know? Let's see. And then I, I guess that's about all that they got on that. There but are I just... also lots of other videos, which um, if I were on my uh, my laptop, I could <laughs> share. But there are lots of other videos, and I'll send you links so you can put them in the description, um, of um, predominantly in Asia, where there are more people, as cell phones have become more prevalent, getting video of beans in the sky that... They call the lawn 
uh, the dragons, um, specifically when there's clouds, when there's storms, um, which is traditional for the Chinese dragon to be a part of storms and lightning and stuff. And they'll get just fantastic video of some of the silhouettes in the clouds and stuff. Um, they also have gotten videos of these creatures glowing, which um, if you read in Job, and I'm sure we'll bring that up, that it says that they glow and a lot of um, Oriental myth and legend says that they can glow, um, especially whenever um, it's mating season. And um, then they, they've also gotten some video of these dragons in China um, being like a chameleon um, where they can blend in very, very, very well with their environment and they're getting caught on uh c c t v cameras um and, and because those have gotten so much better and you'll see like just this little flash of movement and then you can follow it if you slow it down and realize oh that is a creature moving there that's basically invisible and it's just, it's really neat as camera technology has improved. And yes, Photoshop technology has also improved. And it's very easy to become a Photoshop wizard. So there's always that high possibility that all of that could be Photoshopped, edited, made. Well, I know what we oh, caught was definitely something that that some of you, I don't think I saw it at the time. I can't remember. It's been a while. But um it, but it looked like it was like blipping in and out of our reality, kind of. It it looked like it wasn't completely in our dimension. And it reminded me of a lot of the Bigfoot footage that it seems like they're only partly in our dimension at the time. So if these are inter some of them, not all of them, some of them may be interdimensional beings is what I'm thinking, right? And and we don't know if if you've read uh like Dr. Michael Heiser's books or if you've listened to some of his podcasts or or seen him in interviews, uh you know, he he talks about the divine council and how there is a whole society and a whole civilization in heaven. And if there is that you know, we have heaven is a kingdom. So it's not just a city, it's a kingdom. And, you know, there's a lot more to it. Then they're probably, heaven probably has its own creatures as well. So, you know, maybe some of the well, dragons are God, creatures. You know, the, the Bible points out that God is not a God of chaos. He is a God of order. And we see that order comes from a system and a hierarchy um, of authority. And so while God is completely capable of doing everything himself, he is an inclusive God who likes to include his creation and he um, and he's a God of order. So it's you know, it's pretty clear that there is a hierarchy in the angelic realm. And whenever you go and read a lot of especially, again, the Orient, in the Orient, the dragons in China and stuff where they really studied these creatures, um, you can see that there is absolutely a hierarchy and that they they served a purpose. They had a job. And not all dragons were the same. Some were just creatures, were animals, and some, you know, and definitely like among the Orient, those dragons were more angelic, divine, or otherworldly, to put it. So, um, yeah, we de we definitely see that, and I definitely recommend uh, Dr. Michael Heiser's The Unseen Realm. It's kind of a yeah, good, but I would yeah. love to have you go back to that picture, the one that looks like it's a chimera or something. On well, that one, uh, kind of looks like that too. Yeah, but some of these are amazing. Now, Catherine was talking about the Asian 
uh, some of the Asian stuff. And this is, yeah, I'm having trouble staying in the right I think spot. we're getting close. Are we getting close to Chinese New Year? I mean, not Chinese New Year. I meant to say dragon. I will. I mean, it's coming close, getting close. The, the year of the dragon is right. Coming. The year of the dragon. All of the other animals in the Chinese zodiac are all actual yeah. creatures. Why would they throw in a mythological creature? No, I've always thought that too. I was thought, but yeah, it's, it's so obvious to someone who like wants to know. And, and we've got not only. I mean, dragons were huge in the Orient. I, but they were huge that one. That's it. That's else. the one. That one. Go back. Oh, oh you, it's not really that, one. the, that one's just weird. <laughs> it is. And I've got some others that are very similar. Uh, some of them almost look like they've got the face of a person. But, uh -huh. You know, and then yeah. the rocks, if you there, believe there were the many petrified. different kinds of dragons. Well, and for I sure. think it's, yeah, and it's been like almost erased from European history. It's like you have these few little icons of dragon type things in European stuff, but uh, I don't think we have a real good concept of all of the drawings and paintings and and uh, tapestries and stuff that highlighted dragons. Here it's even in a, uh, a, a, a dictionary. An old dictionary. As rare, not as mythological, but as rare you know yeah and then there's the the fact that it's, there's evidence virtually for every single continent including uh, there's even evidence for antarctica as well um so you know if you go back in time you realize they weren't not not getting into the spiritual stuff able to communicate with each other how did so many different continents continue you know have the same looking creatures in their art right um, right and here we have and the I just stones from south america as well i mean you know and i've got several of them that they show i just wanted to sorry yeah you're fine i just wanted to go back to something that Catherine had mentioned earlier when she was talking about i believe it was in asia with the the dragons who glow sometimes especially when they're looking for a mate and that is actually something that you hear about in africa too i don't remember specifically which country in africa but on the continent of africa there are dragons that they um, describe as looking very similar to pterodactyls, but they have glowing red bellies as they fly along. And then you have in Canada, in Lake Okanagan, there is a sea serpent called Ogopogo, who Catherine had also mentioned how some of them camouflage. Ogopogo, there are some photos that have been taken of what is supposedly Ogopogo camouflaged in with its backgrounds. And then um, I there's the Tetzel worm in Germany and Austria and um, in Switzerland. I think it's called the Stoll worm in, in Switzerland. But many of those accounts, that dragon, that serpent has the face that's very feline like. Um, and also very interestingly, that one is said to live underground, as does the Naga in Hindu ah, mythology. So interesting. Yeah. 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 Ah. I just noticed that. I was like, it lives, I, I think that it means mine, something about the mines. It's said to live in the mines. Um, I don't remember if it's mine dweller, but it's something to do with the mines. That's what stolworm means in the Swiss version of the Tetzel worm. So yeah. Isn't that interesting? Well, and Marco Polo talked about, I was specifically looking for a, a depiction of what Marco Polo recorded that he saw in Asia, the Chinese emperor, supposedly his uh, chariot was pulled by dragons. And I would assume, of course, we've got this depiction here, and I don't know where it's from, but I would assume that that would have been, you know, big lizards or something. But then we have some of these depictions, and that doesn't look like a big lizard, you know? So I, I think that even some of the uh, Christian, you know, uh, depictions of some of this stuff, is even kind of trying to differentiate a mythological thing from what we scientifically 
you know, happen to think of as, you know, like dinosaurs. And I, I, I mean, why do we do that? Why do we do that? This well, that makes me think of something that, because they're, one of the arguments against dinosaurs are dragons is that they don't live in water. But most recently, I think it was around 2020, when they discovered um, a particular dinosaur that actually can't remember the name starts with an S that had there's evidence that it lived in water does yeah. anyone remember the name of that one um well of course the bible uh, talks about dinosaurus it... or stegosaurus one of those one of those two yeah the well in the nessie the type that nessie probably is is a but that's it, right but they yeah so they're like when you said about the science so like it makes me think about that and it's like well mm -hmm. there's a you know there you go the dinosaurs you know, the more they learn, the more they realize, well, that this dinosaur lived on water, then that can't, that isn't as strong of an argument that they're not the same. Um, although we, they probably aren't always the same, but a lot of the things that people think of as dinosaurs may have been dragons or vice versa. Right, right. I think they, I think they just came out with the dinosaur explanation as a way to explain away the dragons in the Bible, because we know that they're always trying to disprove the Bible or to show that it's just something that is fantasy. So if they pull in the dragons and pull in the scientific worldview, then people cease looking at dragons in the way that the Bible intended them to be viewed. Yeah, that's definitely. my opinion. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, exactly. I, I they try to mesh um science the view of science with you know bible and and taking out all of the fantastical stuff and i think that's kind of a loophole something that we sh we should try not to do this is a really good website and i'll put a link to it uh genesis park and they talk about the fiery serpents and they did a real good job and showed some really good pictures in there um yeah, I, I think we need to be careful not to put God in a box, especially not a science box. A yeah. majority of science that we have today is hypotheses. They're, they're not even, not a, it takes a lot to make an actual hardcore theory and then to actually prove something and say that it is scientific law. But a lot of times they are pushing hypotheses off as scientific law. And that is not science. It needs to be observable, you know, and and as Bible believers, we know that any science is only going to back up the Bible. It, it, and so know. far we have a growing growing number of scientists who are becoming christians or at the very least saying that they're no longer atheists because what they are finding is that there is more and more creator of this universe yes whether they want to admit it or not and that's in all and branches I, I of science also, Right, right. Yeah, there's so much evidence for I also for wanted design. to bring up, too, um, that, uh, you know, something whenever I first started searching for dragons in the Bible, um, you know, w one of my first mistakes was to look for the word dragon. And, <laughs> but we have to understand that God and Adam gave all of the animals unique names yes. and then definitely with the english language we like to classify everything as one thing so if it looks like a horse it's called a horse and only the horse people are going to know that's an appaloosa that's a quarter horse that's a thoroughbred it's not all the same horse and same with dogs and same with dragons and god whenever you read through the bible he is specific about certain kinds of dragons now you know in psalms you'll see that many of the authors there in psalms specifically david would just kind of classify them all as dragons but then whenever god is talking to somebody and if he brings up dragons he's very particular and two in particular that we know the best would be behemoth and leviathan 
and they are two very different creatures. Behemoth is actually a creature. It is an animal. Whereas Leviathan is depicted as something very intelligent that actually has power and dominion over the children of pride. So not so much a creature. And it's just important whenever you are going on this journey, on the search yourself, to keep that in understanding that dragon, it the word dragon just is a group of very diverse creatures that are some animals and some not. Right, right. Definitely. Yeah. And then we have more words even beyond that. Like uh, Shelly was talking about the Naga and the Nakash. So we have serpent. And what was this serpent and what was actually going on in uh, the Garden of Eden? You know, we know that it was the serpent that uh, was tempting Eve, but exactly what it was, what was it that that he was he was tempting right um and whenever his leg he was had to run around on his belly was that meaning that god like cut his legs off or was maybe he you know like earthbound at that point where he couldn't go back and forth between the earth and heaven anymore or did he take his wings you know something like that so eating the dust of the earth i know that be- is like so amazing to me like how where did we get the idea that where, where did that start that he i mean and with that one first time i saw that picture showing that serpent on the pole as being something that like they had wings i, I mean it just never occurred to me that satan may not have ever had legs per se that it may not have been legs it doesn't say that he lost legs it just said he would go around on the dust on his belly it didn't say that he was we just assume that or at least i always did um that yeah you're going to show some pictures about that yeah that, yeah and, um distinct distinguishing between the i know that and get maybe getting ahead of you but um, no that that's that's fine the the nakash the serpent um that's more than likely where the people of india get the word naga right and the Naga came in several different forms. And it's not just India. This is Egyptian right here. Okay. So we have the Egyptians. We have uh, the from India. And then we have like um, Medusa from the the Greek and Roman stuff. I mean, does this kind of Medusa-ish give you that feel of it with some of this stuff? Um, Makes me think but- of mermaids. Yeah, it does. It does. And, you know, were these Nephilim, were these created, you know, messed up? Were they abominations or were they actually, you know, the fallen angels or something? When I was reading about the Naga, I found that to be really interesting because they're said to be half human, half, I think they said cobra, half serpent. And if you think about that, that would almost sound like some sort of Nephilim because the watchers were said by some to have very reptilian features and their their offspring, the Nephilim, were said to have very long necks and very reptilian features as well. And it just takes you on this whole other rabbit trail um, because then you have the word seraphim. It it. It's from the word seraph, which means fiery serpent. And the seraphim are the ones, it, it, the holy ones in, in heaven who are exalting God over his throne. And so that just brings you into a whole other, you know, rabbit hole of what that could possibly mean. You know, I, there are so and many. And it kind of wraps it into, yeah, that rabbit hole kind of wraps into you know, what are some of the biggest dragon stories famous for? Dragon stealing maidens. It's we, you know, especially in Europe um, and in Africa as well, there are lots of stories about how 
dragons can only be tamed by maidens or that they would kidnap maidens you know those those are the the fun stories that live on that we like to associate dragons with and um you know saint george and the dragon was one of those was probably the most popular one and it kind of whenever you start thinking about the naga and being half serpent half human was it perhaps you know um some of these beings draconic beings that intermingled with them or you know yeah it's a whole rabbit trail that you can go down on for sure especially when you look into um the way that europeans label what we might call the nephilim bloodline one of the bloodlines they call the dragon bloodline and that's actually where vlad the impaler you know his name was vlad dracul it and it means basically it's of the dragon so it just makes you want, and a lot of royal families in Europe today claim to be descendants of, in this house of dragons. So, and it, and then when you hear the story of the Naga that was half human, half serpent, you're just like, wow, what is this? What is all this? Right. Yeah. And right. it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, because whenever Ezekiel, isn't it Ezekiel that's explaining the throne of God and he's saying the living creatures that are around the throne have got the heads of these different creatures. So mm -hmm. if there are those, then there probably are more. Whatever is in the Bible is stuff that has been put there specifically that is necessary for us for these days, right? For, for us to know. But he wasn't going to put everything in there. It's like, we don't have everything about every day of Yeshua's life. So, you know, we didn't need all of that, right? We just needed the the basics of what was going on. And that's how he did it with all the Bible, because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he wasn't going to go in and explain all of this to us, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then, exactly. you know, what I keep thinking about is the underground stuff, because there have been for the last few years floating through the Internet stories of people going down into the underground tunnels that are in the United States and worldwide to rescue children and coming and running into these monsters, whatever, whatever they mean by monsters. Right. Right. That really makes I think about that a lot. Like they don't even really understand like the people that are, are these stories are going around are not even necessarily understanding what the Bible says about it, but the fact that they're currently there's evidence for them under there. Under yeah, us. So the talk of the reptilians too. You yeah, know, you have yeah. to think, does that tie in with the dragons? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, with the royalty right. family saying and that they're descendants of the <laughs> the dragon <laughs> bloodline. <laughs> Well, and, you know, something else going back to, again, the Oriental dragons, which are just my absolute favorite and have the most whenever you go read um, texts and documents from um, China and India, those two places observed the dragons very closely and very good records and details about them. And they talked about... Um, how some types of dragons could shapeshift and we still have those stories that circulate they're very popular in a lot of games and um it, it, it and you know it just well and i mean if you think of one of the more recent dragon movies that i really really liked uh reina and the last dragon the dragon shape shifted there and th that comes from a lot of these stories these myths that some of these dragons could shape shift and if they were able to do that then theoretically and there are a lot of romance authors that play with this unfortunately <laughs> procreate yes yes yeah, there's even a Merlin episode that the show, the show Merlin, there's an episode where there is a dragon who shapeshifts into an old man. And in fact, the the Naga, again, going back to that, they were also said to be able to shapeshift from um, a beautiful human 
back into a serpent like form. Yeah. 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 So there there is always that that possibility. And um you know, it just I I very much believe that a lot of the oriental dragons were given freedom of choice uh, that they were they were divine beings or at least interdimensional beings that were given a level of power um and that they were also given freedom of choice i think every creature basically has its own freedom of choice so and they can choose to do what they want with those gifts and powers that they are given yeah um i was going to give a little bit of a caution i i pulled up this right here and uh it, this is from one of the uh universities and it talks about the nakash um and what it signifies um to hiss to whisper to divine incantation enchantment um but unfortunately some articles like this this uh let's see northern illinois university this particular thing is trying to show how it's it's racist. It's basically racist. They're trying to use like the Nakash of the Bible to prove that some people of a different color are not as human as the rest of us or something it it's sad so i this was one yeah, of the first things that old problem <laughs> yes old. And it just it's so frustrating so if you go and you start searching some of these things out yourself you know i definitely look up the hebrews concordance on the word but then whenever you're pulling up some of this stuff even if it's from a university be careful of what it is that you're pulling up because what is this referring to i mean i, I advertise it it makes me think that this is what darwin because i had his his book at one time that he it's wrote from he, the he pretty much what it says. so this is definitely not saying that the university is racist or anything like it's that an advertisement that's weird yeah it's an older book it's it's a copy of an older you know thing but I, it you know we need we just need to be careful yeah a a lot i have run into this where a lot of people in the nephilim believing community where you know the the tin hat nephilim tin hat community we'll call them that um where they will get so steeped in the nephilim i don't know what you want to call it fear mongering or something to where they are so obsessed over impure blood and nephilim tainted and if you have six fingers six toes or i have seen some of them talk about if you have more melanin or less melanin then you are nephilim and you're doomed to hell and um well, bible's and pretty specific that that doesn't matter that you have freedom of choice and even the angels had freedom of choice free will so you can always it doesn't matter it, it's pretty specific yeah, you can choose on nobody on is doomed because they have an extra finger or anything like that I, we probably at this point we're close enough to the end that probably everybody has probably got some hebrew tribal blood and probably all of us have got a little bit of nephilim blood so we are probably all tainted at this point hence the need for a new body whenever he comes back <laughs> and i'm looking forward to that <laughs> amen <laughs> yes yep yep oh here's the tetzel worm is that how you say it the alpine dragon like creature yeah another word another word for it is actually the the lindworm i forgot about that one 
there are many different names for it, but I found it really interesting because now that picture, it looked more like serpent-like in the face, but in a lot of the illustrations of it, it has a feline face, which I thought was very different, you know? Although yeah. I have seen, Catherine, don't some Chinese dragons have, have like whiskers or something like that? Yes. Yes, traditionally the dragons in the Orient um, across China and India um, had whiskers, yes, mm -hmm. and they were usually very often depicted with uh, antlers um, that, let me see, the best description I read from a Chi oh, and I, I cannot remember the book. I saw this and it was very old and very much out of print and impossible to find. Um, but a Oriental man from way back when, he described them as having the, usually the face of a camel. Um, I can't remember how he described the whiskers. Um, but then the antlers of a deer and um, the claws of a tiger. And um, kind of reminds you of one of the beasts and Daniel, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, and kind of going back and, to, and yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, no. I, I was just reading. I think kind of going back to the idea of the free will, we have Psalm 148 here that says, praise the Lord from the earth, ye dragons. I mean, it's talking, praise him, all you angels, the hosts, the stars. It's talking about everything to praise him. And it's including the dragons. And I know when Catherine came out with her first book, uh, I had some homeschool moms online that just tried to butcher me about it because, you know, oh, that's, you know, that's not Christian enough or something. And dragons uh, well, are evil. Yeah. Many people come from the assumption that dragons are evil because Satan is depicted as a dragon. And, but it's one of those things that's like, well, he was also depicted as a lion too. So are lions evil? Exactly. Especially when Jesus is also depicted as the Lion of Judah. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, again, I think we need to be careful not to put God in a box, right? That's why I love How to Train Your Dragon so much. Oh yes, <laughs> yes. Because they all thought they were they all thought they were evil, and yeah, yeah. And the, and then they ended up making friends with the dragons. Yeah, and and you know some of them are beasts. And it's kind of like the platypus or, you know, creatures like that, that we can't really categorize in a certain kind. It's a kind of its own, right? A lot of these dragons, we're putting the big word dragon on it, but they probably, there are probably different kinds of dragons as well, right? And I was even thinking there might even be some things still in existence today that they may have referred to as a dragon. I think of the oarfish. If anything looks like a sea serpent, the oarfish looks like a sea serpent. So I have to think to myself, is that something that maybe um, back in those days, were they referring to that as one of the types of dragons? Well, so, and we and, have, yeah, yeah, we have to remember too that everything before the flood was much, much bigger than it is now. Yeah, so, and they're huge now. I can only imagine how big they were. How big been they would have been then, exactly. Yeah. And that's why I was showing some of these pictures because, I mean, these are, well, that one's play, but, you know, a, a lot of these, can you, can you imagine a horny toad being, right. you know, several times its size? That would definitely look like a dragon to me. And some of these do basically have wings you know so it, it just if you think and then I used to have a pet bearded dragon so they don't get very big now but same thing you know before the flood they would have been monstrous and yes they definitely look like the the typical what you would imagine as a dragon so yes I they're they, they're still around nowadays they're just not how we envision them to be 
Yes. It really, it really makes me think about how classification, humans classifying things, deciding what they're going, what it, what it is based on so-called science and yes. how that, you know, really muddies things up. Um, yeah. And that, you know, people trust blindly, like what, what things are being called. Like, oh, a scientist says that can't be a dragon. So it must not be a dragon kind right. of thing. It's yeah. just very gray. They're very gray areas that most people don't realize. It's not as black and white as they're led to believe as far as the way they classify things. We've been very taught. Subjective. Yeah, we've been taught to doubt ourselves and doubt what we see, what we hear, what we, you know, and whenever it comes to like news media and stuff, we probably should be. But, um, you know, if these people were writing books when when paper was precious, you know, or when ink was precious, when they before they even had the printing press with some of this stuff, this was hand drawn. Um, why would they waste the time and the resources putting mythical fake creatures on this stuff, you know? And why would there, in that case, also, if they were mythical, made-up creatures, why would there be so much uniformity across the world with yeah. their scales, their wings, their fire, their shapes, and everything? Yeah, even if you take something like this and you consider the artistic difference of this and a, a couple of pictures that I showed before, there's still a lot of similarities between the two. They have what a lot beautiful. of the same things. I love this one, colors. Yeah. yeah. Chinese, is this from China, that one, that last one? Yeah, Orient somewhere. I'm, I'm not good at, now this one, I think this was a Huang, two-headed. It's got a head here. And head here. I think this is a piece of ivory that was carved. Once again, why would you spend the time and the resources, you know, carving this beautiful piece if there wasn't? Where would you get the idea to do it? Yeah, yeah. Again, I mean, it's, it's it's about the like what Catherine just said. I mean, all these people and all these different continents. Okay, we're not just talking countries. Continents. We're using their artistic expression to draw things that were so much alike. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, as you get, as time has gone by and as more science, so as more like fossil, fossil finding has happened, then you see how much that they look like what these drawings were anciently. I mean, go into the, you know, world and you find all these drawings and all this artwork. And that was before they discovered dinosaurs in the 1800s. And in fact, when they first started reconstructing dinosaurs, they didn't look anything like they looked ridiculous when you look at the pictures of them. Now, Mike, wow. But the people that lived 500 or 1,000 years before that did, depicted them correctly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, how exactly. did they know what they looked like? Well, they saw them. That's how. Exactly. And that um, the video that you showed, Donita, of the of the dragons, and you said that one was similar to what you saw. That reminds me of the one that I told you ladies before. That two of my daughters swear they saw a dragon, and they're not excitable women. You know, they're just very matter of fact and don't really. They're not into this stuff like I am. But they went for a walk and they came home and insisted to me that they saw a dragon flying. And so I actually called one of my daughters today, right before this, just to ask her again, do you remember, can you describe to me what it looked like? And she said to me, it looked like a pterodactyl, but they called it a dragon. And I do remember that when it happened, I show, I went on Google and I was showing them photos of herons because they said it had a tail, a long skinny tail. So I showed them photos of herons who kind of fly with their two skinny legs pointed back. They said, no, that wasn't it. Cranes, no, that wasn't it. It wasn't any of the birds that I showed to them. And they said the closest thing that, that they could think of would be a pterodactyl. And then it, it just, I think it would have been very similar to what Donita saw. And then we saw that first photo of the men holding the wings out on that creature. Yeah. And 
So I think they're they're rare, just like that that old dictionary said. They're very rare, but they're still here. Yeah, yeah. You know that and picture you just showed um, with them on their with the the crowns on their head. I find that very interesting. The one where the dragons are wearing crowns. Oh yeah, yeah, and the eye is all over them. I mean, I'm sure there's more to the story. There, on this. there are many, many different kinds of dragons as once i understood that and understood that you know the word dragon just summarizes a whole group of creatures that were like i don't know what to call that you're a dragon that's what you are <laughs> and <laughs> once, once i understood that then as you read the stories as you um go through the myths and legends you start putting the you start sorting it you start recognizing the characteristics so like with this rainbow dream serpent it is most popular in africa it, that's where if you google that up it'll come up in africa but in new mexico some of the native american tribes also talked about a rainbow very large serpent also in New Mexico area, uh, Arizona area, many of the tribes had a story. I'm trying to remember which one specifically now, um, but had a story about a dragon, a creature, a horned serpent, which the uh, I know the Cherokee have many stories about horned serpents. Um, but this particular case they talked about how he could shape shift and how he could grow very large or very small, which whenever you read about Oriental dragons in um, India and China, they also are described as being able to grow very large or very small at will, that they are very intelligent. And this Native American legend also put out that he was very intelligent he liked being in the mountain, but then he also liked being in a lake. Again, very, very similar to the dragons described in India. And that he um, had a run in with a maiden who, and he was benevolent. He was described as benevolent. And, but again, there was that maiden connotation there where obviously there's a little bit of a weakness there so um but whenever you start reading these stories all across the world you start realizing hey this story from new mexico sounds very similar to some of the stories i read in india and some of those sound very similar to some of the stories i read in africa and the African stories sound very similar to some of the ones in South America. And then there's other stories you read. It's like, oh, I have no idea what that was, but I don't ever want to meet it. So it's it's interesting to start trying your brain once it understands that there are some differences. There are some that are actual monsters. There are some that are creatures that were animals and then there are some that i don't know if you want to classify them as divine or um otherworldly or interdimensional but they are very intelligent and not an animal and once you understand that then you can start recognizing where these creatures have shown up all across the world and where they may have had different names for them, you know, rainbow dream serpent in South America may get called Quetzalcoatl. But once you start reading the stories and you match the characteristics, you realize, okay, this may be a similar entity or similar creature. Yeah, and and we can't just pass them off. And sorry, Catherine, but no, you're fine. No, I, you know, and I want to say something about the colors on these snakes because it, because beautiful. the idea that that snakes are evil because they were they were you know Satan and then he lost his legs and stuff. But God created these, right? Like the, yes. Look at the beautiful design on these. Um, yeah. 
And that can, you know, if, if we have these that we have photographs of, you know, that people can actually find and see, then how are we going to say that something like this from Australia, you know, isn't real, that these people weren't actually seeing whatever it was? Because we have these beautiful things that we can see. Why? Why? Those are not in our house, right? No, these aren't in our house. We don't have pretty <laughs> ones like they're beautiful. Well, as long we got some house. pretty ones. <laughs> yes, we have had snakes in the house before. Okay, it it <laughs> happens. We're in an old farmhouse. <laughs> Debbie laughs. Well, but... <laughs> like if if you um go on Instagram, I I dislike snakes, but I am absolutely sometimes enthralled by how uh community have been breeding these snakes to just have gorgeous unbelievable colors um some of them just undescribable iridescent colors especially right after they shed they're stunning creatures and it's absolutely beautiful i definitely recommend if you're not terrified of snakes like i am that you go look up some of these python accounts and stuff and go look at these pet snakes that people are breeding and some of the colors are just absolutely stunning on these creatures yeah, yeah they're pretty to look and at no but genetic. i don't want to touch them no no <laughs> genetic modification right like this is natural breeding they're not doing any genetic modification what I you know what I mean right. like now, there's now, you can breed for colors and all that but that's different than what I'm talking about yeah, I'm talking about yeah. doing the laboratory natural and stuff. breeding process yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely a natural breeding process and I mean breeding is in its own way a genetic modification to an extent and you know and they selectively breed for these colors so that's not saying that that's probably not destroying these snakes dna in some way but still they're getting some fantastic colors out of these creatures yeah yeah I, they wouldn't I be able to do it if the genes weren't there already right i mean right evolution right. says you can add information but you can't so the only way they could get those colors unless they're in the laboratory doing something with their dna right. they're getting what was in the original which makes you wonder what they look like originally, right? Like before all the patients hit. Right, right. Yeah, I, I didn't realize whenever I started doing the slides and stuff for this, that Greek mythology had so many different kinds of dragons. So they, and I'm not even going to try to say what some of these are, but this was a very interesting set of creatures that this one talks about and then doesn't norse mythology have a world serpent i believe yes, yes. world yes. serpent that goes around the tree right yes yeah I mean, or, or uh, eat, is that the roots of the tree eating eating the roots of the tree there were actually several there were different serp serpents or dragons in norse mythology as well and there was the one that wrapped around the world. Uh, um, there was one in the sea. And then there was one at the roots of the tree. So, um, yes, whenever you go through, it's not just uh, the Chinese and uh, uh, China and India that it's been found that they classified these different dragons and created descriptions of them and or i say created wrote down descriptions of them and told stories about them you can find it in greece you can find it in norse stories you can find it pretty where they could enough together to have records and books and stories written down yeah it just amazes me once you start digging into some of this stuff how much how how much you can find in in all the different places. I mean, it just goes on and on and on all the different dragons that they there's the dragons pulling the chariot there. Oh yeah, that it's like even in Antarctica, right? When I was doing the research for my 
product that I created a while back that I was surprised that there was stuff in Antarctica. I was like, oh, I wonder if there's anything in Antarctica because you don't hear about it. But there were several videos, websites, um, just regular websites, not not conspiratorial websites showing things that you wouldn't expect at, in Antarctica. Yeah, and I didn't even get there. We may have to. Yeah. I didn't even think to look in Antarctica. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, this is a deep, deep dive that could take you days, days of searching and talking and looking at. And it's really impossible to just pick out all of, even one story, every corner of Earth, because there's so many of them. There's so many of them that tie together uh, and it just, I, yeah, I could spend forever talking about these different stories that tie together and connect the dot across the world. If you do homeschool or you have grandchildren that spend a lot of time with you, Debbie's got some very interesting uh, dragon studies that that she has in her teachers pay teacher store just all kinds of fun stuff here that you would enjoy I I almost wish I still had little ones this is stuff that I may have to come up with for the grandchildren as they get a little bigger lots, yeah. lots yeah. of fun stuff there we yeah, I was just thinking today that like if you want to teach like with the dragon thing that I did, if you wanted to teach your kids, but you know, you can have all the books, but actually having it set up so that you can teach that to, you know, present it to them. That that is what that's partly what I did with the dragons uh, myth or legend. I forget what I called it now. Myth or <laughs> real or whatever, um, you know, a, a PowerPoint presentation that that helps with teaching it. Yeah. Right. And then lots of hands-on activities to support it. Yeah, this uh the Mud Fossil University has some really interesting stuff. And he shows an area where he thinks there was a slain dragon. I can't remember where he said he thought this was. Was this Iceland? Or... I think it's northern Africa. Maybe it is. Okay. There, yeah. There's a lot more videos yeah. coming up on YouTube with that sort of stuff where people are, it, thanks to, you know, Google Earth and and the satellite technology and everything, people are able to go look at these places across the world. Wait a minute. Is that a natural rock formation? <laughs> or was yes. that a creature like i don't want to live in the same place that that's alive <laughs> exactly exactly and i know he's got a couple of these i'll make sure and put the links to these below now i am curious we have gone just about an hour and i hate to keep any everybody too much longer than this but emmy i'm curious as to since you're our newest tin hatter in the group I'm curious as to what some of this information has meant to you. This has actually been really cool. Um, in fact, I'm having thinking back to conversations that I've had before. In fact, I remember in college, a friend of mine was telling me about someone's journal back in the 1500s, maybe. Uh, I'm really not sure. But he was he was describing uh this he was he was telling me dragons are real and which I thought was kind of cool at the time I still you know still not like sure that I really would like them to be real because like I, I want to go riding on a dragon I really do I think that'd be so much fun, um, but he was saying that that like in these these things that like they had this cave there was a dragon there and a one that breathed fire because I think that was something that I didn't see I like you because uh, a couple of y'all alluded to. Um, like them glowing when they were mating but like so where like where did the fire breathing come in because I like I didn't quite catch that like where did that come in in the in the tails I guess or was that from the mating season well I mean 
it showed in a lot of the pictures that I was showing. And then Moses, whenever he ran into the fiery serpents, it, okay. you know, maybe that was the ven venom that was stinging, or maybe they were actually mm. shooting fire that was burning them. I don't know. But we have several creatures in nature that we know of that do put forth some kind of a fire or something, lightning bugs and things like that. Um, mm. And right. answers in Genesis, which I don't agree with them on everything that they've got, but a lot of the creation scientists also talk about how some of the dinosaurs, because of the big thing on their head and whatnot, uh, definitely mm. could have had some kind of an apparatus in there that made it for the kids well and it talks about in job with leviathan that, that um, you thinking. know his sneezings whenever he sneezes, there's a light in his nose and we know that after the flood a lot of things in this world changed so whatever the purpose of that was before if he's on this earth it there's going to be some sort of chemical reaction what the original purpose of it was for not sure but now at least there's a chemical reaction and uh, you know just like animals with their frills or their feathers or horses whenever they curl their neck and they pump their chest muscles they've learned that this can become a dominance thing it can be a scare tactic and they can they've learned to use it and leviathan it sounds like you know he definitely uses it as a fear tactic as he's laughing at people trying to throw spears at him and stuff and in india it was described that they would use it to um warm the water that they were staying in um mm -hmm. the females usually lived in the ocean and the males lived in the mountains and the mm -hmm. uh they would use it sometimes as defense not very often usually um and then in the orient um they different dragons had different abilities um most of them actually could not breathe fire it was only the highest dragon in the hierarchy that could so the emperor's dragon or the uh the five the five-toed dragon was usually the only one that could breathe fire not all of them could so <laughs> um again different classifications different ages right. quite possibly and and then if if, if it's a natural thing to them yeah, why not use fire? I like fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. And I appreciate too the the perspective too about the the classification thing because that was something that I hadn't really thought much about either. Um that there's all these like crazy things that we just classify them as dragons because we don't know what else to call them. So that was really helpful also. And it made me think of a book that I really enjoyed once called Serafina. I don't know if y'all have ever read Serafina. Um, but it was about like dragons that could turn into people and people that could turn into, I was like, what in the world? And then y'all, I was like, oh my word, they could really do this. So yeah, that's kind of cool. And they used the so, name Seraph, Seraphina. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I'll have to look that up. Yeah, that was the, I know I was just thinking of that when that you said, the oh, name. probably spell with an F though, huh? Did they spell yeah. it with an F? Um, I don't remember. I, it was one of those. I read it I think I borrowed it from the library or something and then I I always meant to go back and look for it and I never did now I may just I'm like okay I need to go look for it again see if she ever wrote the sequel Gosh, to the book it's hard to remember I names think it's, sometimes I think it's spelled with a ph um I remember seeing that book I can't remember if I read it but I remember seeing it before yeah oh wow so I, I really like oh one. I think I think oh. I think I might have seen the f version that's why uh it's this one yeah hartman yep um, so there's actually saw... those are two different wow interesting i guess there's not a cop i guess there's not a trademark on on that name huh no because you can't trademark book name like book names and stuff and you can't trademark names i mean you know like like this so so the one you read was seraphina and the other one this yeah the one the first one right there the seraphina by Hartman, Hartman, Rachel Hartman, Hartman. yeah. 
she was supposed to write more and i don't know that she ever did um like it definitely leaves you like there's supposed to be more to this <laughs> um, because that's not the right book right no that one is oh wait which I one i think that's the same i don't think right. that box that's what I mean. is the yeah, same the, one the box, yeah the, the one that's spelled with an f yeah because that's something yeah the one that's spelled with an f is something else so um, unless they just, she just didn't call the sequel. Oh, I think I might I don't have know. seen that red one before somewhere. Yeah, that's the that's that cover is definitely the one that I borrowed and read. I recognize the cover. Looks interesting because it's it looks it like really a good. place in like Britain, what Europe somewhere, right? I don't remember. Sorry. I mean, just based on the picture maybe I, it may be a super like a fantasy world um maybe i'm sorry i really i, I read, read it a long dragon. time ago so i don't that was remember an interesting book. <laughs> brian, brian davis's Dragons. books are are very interesting and he has dragon i people that are part dragon in his book yeah, yeah. and they they are definitely from a christian author uh, we've really enjoyed his books yeah I think the only reason I didn't keep reading it is because it was only the first one was free and I would have gotten costly for me to keep buying them and I yeah, yeah. we actually like got the books audio over. books and yeah. we we listened to the the audio we've got the cds but yeah I, I might have read the second one too I don't remember they're ah. a lot of fun he's got several series now so there's a bunch there Oh, goodness. Well, girls, it's getting late. We probably ought to wrap this up. Any closing thoughts? I just wanted to share that you showed the the what Roger Spur from Mud Fossil University says is a dragon in North Africa. And there's actually, if you go on Google Earth and look, there is one very similar to that on the eastern coast of North America. It's like starts like maybe down in Florida and goes all the way up, even through Pennsylvania, possibly into New York, like up the entire coast. Wow. So and and also some of the mountains really do look like the ridges on the back. So something really interesting to look at if anyone's interested. Yeah. yeah. There's also one like that in Nevada, Arizona, much smaller, but definitely very stark whenever you're looking at it from a bird's eye view it's like oh hello yeah wow <laughs> I love that. that's so cool <laughs> yeah definitely get out there do some reading do your own research pick up old books that talk about this and uh, just you know look at what other countries other people who have researched these creatures have said and just compare stories apples to oranges mm -hmm. definitely definitely and don't just assume because it says you know mythological or legend or fantasy creature don't don't assume let's not put god in a mm -hmm. box he can do lots of things and yeah he's made I'd say really amazing creatures yeah, I think that's sometimes to me when it says believers. Sorry, go ahead, Emmy. Oh, you're good. I was just saying sometimes as Bible believers, it it we can it can feel strange to do that. And I would just like that's one of the big things. It's like it's a it's like God is not afraid of our questions. He's not afraid for us to dig into these things because he wants us to find out how he made things. And I think it's exciting and I love it and I'm enjoying it so much. <laughs> yeah. And I want other people to enjoy it too. Yeah. Right. And don't be afraid of the truth. Don't be afraid of the truth. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and sometimes when it says mythological or fantasy and we've talked about this before ladies you know sometimes to me that adds more credibility it does not take it away so, <laughs> yeah especially in this day and age, so. i know right <laughs> i know i agree yeah. i'm there now <laughs> yes definitely <laughs> yeah and definitely if it's mentioned in the bible like dr michael heiser said if it's in the bible and it's weird it's probably important <laughs> yes <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you ladies so much for being here this evening. I really appreciate this. I I know that we've had some people that have really been looking forward to this one coming up. So uh, I'm going to get this out as quick as I can because I know they're looking forward to it. So um, thank you all so much.